Howdy folks, I'm Raymond Grace, President and Founder of the Raymond Grace Foundation, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Virtual West Coast Doubting Conference. So let's get started. In traveling across the country for the last 20 some years, I have f found a group of people that in my opinion are potentially the most powerful people on this planet. And I got some good news and some bad news. The good news is it's you, the doubters. The bad news is most of you don't realize it. And I wondered why, and I may have found out. I think you made too many rules. Because I've noticed that if you get three people together, two of them want to make rules for the other one to follow. Well, that's okay, I guess, up to a point. But I think maybe uh, you've limited yourself on with some of the rules that you've made. So I want to share some stories with you of things that we have accomplished over the years. And uh, why am I doing this? Well, I like to help people empower themselves. So when I learned about dowsing back in 93, I saw that these people had uh, quite a bit of ability. And I thought, well, what else can we do with it? So uh, the stories I want to share with you are just some of the things that we've done over the years. Now, I'd like to say that energy changes. We're going to be talking quite a bit about energy here. And energy changes. It's different than it was back when I first started learning about dowsing uh, back in 93. I remember meeting an old dowser over in North Carolina, and he was telling me about noxious energy uh, rays in the, in the earth. And he had me go out and hold my hand out over one, and he could push my hand down rather easily. Then I would stay in another place, and then he took a lot more energy to push my hand down. He said, that's because you were standing over a noxious energy zone, or noxious energy ray, I believe he called it. And he said, now, you can clear these things, and he showed me how, but he said, you have to physically go to the location to do it. Well, that was his belief system, and he was right. But on the way home, I stopped to visit one of my friends, and I said, I would like to check your office and see if I can find any noxious energy rays in it. And I said, draw me a diagram. So she did, and I went over it with a pendulum, and I said, okay, right here, I made a little X, uh, about three different spots on it on the uh, diagram. And she says, that's interesting because everywhere you have made an X is where someone shares is. And says, these people do not feel well. They're just not healthy. And I says, well, I was told I had to go there, but I don't really think that's true. Let's just see if we can clear all those things from here. This was on a Saturday afternoon. By Monday, I got a phone call saying, everybody in the office is so much more cheerful and feels better. What have we done? Well, we had cleared an oxygen energy rays from a distance of about five miles, which was supposed to have been impossible, but I didn't know that, so we did it anyway. Now, over the years, I have noticed a number of things that seem to appear that affects people in a detrimental manner. It, it lowers their energy, or maybe they don't feel good. Well, a few years back, I came up with over a dozen things I had found that just somehow disappeared. Did we work on enough and just really get rid of them, or did they just naturally disappear? I really don't know. I just know that there's things that we found back then that we don't find now, but there's things we find now that we didn't find then. So if you I've written books on some of these things, and I've made films, and these things were true at the time I wrote the book and made the film, but they don't exist anymore. Well, you can't really do a lot of refilming and rewriting just because something changes, but I just wanted to make you aware that uh, things do change with time, and they will probably continue to change. Whenever I got uh, acquainted with doubting, as I said, I was quite impressed, and I realized we can do a lot with this stuff. And the more I did, the more success I had. And then I think, well, I would like to help other people. I would really like to promote doubting to the world. Now, at the time, I was a construction foreman. 
and hardly anybody outside of the community even knew who it was. But I set a goal. I'm going to promote Dowdy to the world. Well, so far, well, as of six years ago, I think, we have reached 142 countries. I get mail from all over the world, and it's all positive, and most of it is it's either asking questions about well, what we do, we do about a certain situation, or thanking me for what I've done for them, something like that. So yes, we, we've done fair, fairly good at promoting dowsing, but we're not done yet. We've made over 40 films uh, about dowsing. We're still making some of them. And if you folks uh, watching this will write me, uh, I will be glad to send you some of them. Or we can go to our YouTube channel. Just type in Raymond Grace uh, YouTube channel, and uh, you can find them there. I don't know if we got them all up there yet or not, but uh, uh, if not, uh, right then I'll go ahead and push a button on the computer and send them to you. Uh, um, this is how we promote a lot of ideas. You just uh, make short little videos and send them out to folks at once. Since I set a goal to promote dowsing, and all it was was an intent, uh, I started getting invitations to go various places, and Ozark Research was one of the places that really allowed me to reach people uh, all over North America. And uh, I've been back there a number of times since. Those folks have done a lot of good and have been very glad to work with them. While I was there, I met people from Canada and Alaska and all over the place that would ask me to come and, and make talks there. So I accepted most of them. And then I got to thinking, if we're really going to promote dowsing, we've got to do a little better than this. So I wrote a book about it. And it was called The Future is Yours, Do Something About It. Well, that got me an invitation to be on Coast to Coast Radio back in 04. Uh, I think I've been on there four times, but that allowed us to reach a few million people around the world. And you say, well, how did somebody from the mountains of Southwest Virginia manage to do this? Uh, probably because I didn't know I couldn't. I simply set a goal. And the goal was to promote that into the world. It's really pretty simple. And Einstein really answered this in about three words. Energy follows thought. So wherever we put our thoughts, we put our energy. See, all my work is based on three very simple principles. Number one is all things, including beliefs, thoughts, memories, and opinions are forms of energy. The intelligent human mind, which means us, can change energy. Number two. Energy is impressed upon matter. You are affected by everywhere you go and the people that come into your lives and things that happen around you. Why? Because thoughts and actions are energy and your physical body is matter. This is where a lot of people get themselves in trouble. Uh, because before you go anywhere with a group of people, you need to clean the place up because you will be affected by the people that are there, either good or bad. And the third principle, as I've already quoted, was from Einstein, energy follows thought. Those three simple principles are behind everything else that we do. And a lot of folks say, well, how do you do this? And the word is intent. And intent and thought is probably about the same thing. So I've got a few notes here that I'll glance down at from time to time to remind me of what stories to tell. It works a little better that way. Um, now, I wrote another little book, very, very simple, no bones, uh, no, uh, just bare bones book, uh, no frills, called Techniques That Work For Me. And it was a simple way to show people how to dial to change energy in their homes, uh, where the kids go to school, in their workplace, and just basically how to make life a whole lot better than what it was. Any time that you set an intent, really think on that and actually create a mental picture of what you want to have. That is one of the best ways to make things happen. Some people explain how things happen. Other people make things happen. They're not necessarily the same people. And other things, there are people that make things happen, there are things that watch things happen, there are people that wonder what happened. So um, not everybody does things just the same way. 
So I want to share one of the earlier stories that uh, we had that really got my attention, that has helped us to promote cleaning up water around the world, because about 30-some years ago, I set a goal to help clean up water in the world, but at the time I had no clue how I was going to do it, but that didn't really bother me much. I think I'll figure it out. So um, one of my buddies and I were traveling across Canada back in 02, I believe it was, and we were invited to spend the night at the place. And I've told this story a lot of times, but not everybody listened after I've heard it, I guess. And once we got to the place, uh, I found out why they invited us. The man said, I have a well here that has just, it's just loaded with arsenic. And I wondered if you'd clean it up for me. And I said, well, I don't know. I don't know anything at all about arsenic, but uh, I'm going to give it a try. He said, well, there's a, a sealed cap on this uh, well, and you can't pour water in it. I said, well, that's okay. So I went out and talked to the water a little bit, just mentally, and uh, I said, please let me know if you have the water tested. Well, this was uh, something called the Canadian Board of Health, I believe it was, that was testing the water. And I get a phone call a couple of months later uh, that 90% of the arsenic is gone. Okay, that's good. Uh, I said, have it, have it tested again one of these days. So a few months later, it was tested again. I get another phone call, barely a trace of arsenic. Where did it go? Well, what I think I did was turn it into water. I, I realize scientifically that's impossible, but I'm not a scientist, so I didn't know that. So I just did it anyway. Now, I got to thinking about it. After I was on Coast to Coast Radio, the talk show host, George Norrie, asked if I would do an experiment for it. And I said, well, what do you want to do? He said, well, if we have the people out there in our listening audience around the world set a container of water by the radio, do you think you could change the energy of it? And I said, I have no idea, but I'm willing to try. Well, it worked. We, even to this day, I still get people coming up to me saying, hey, I was listening to that show that night, and uh, you changed the taste of my water. And I think, well, that's real interesting. Uh, and I got to thinking, you know, if we could change water over radio waves, we could change it with a film. So we made a film on energizing water. And I only made about 100 copies at the time. And we got those distributed out, and we got good feedback, and it worked. Well, since then, we got better equipment and got a little bit smarter and uh, made, uh, made another film on cleaning up water. And when I'm talking to people on the phone in various parts of the world, and they're pretty nice, open-minded people, which most of them usually are, I will ask them, what kind of water do you have? Uh, it, it's good to drink. And you usually say, no, it's just city water, or sometimes they say, I don't even drink it. Uh, I was talking to someone uh, yesterday on the phone, I'd done a session with them, and asked them what kind of water they had. They said, oh, we don't drink water out uh, of the tap, we, we buy it. And that's all. I was doing Skype session with them, so I said, bring a bottle in here, let me, let me take a look at it. And they did, they held it up, and I could see it on the computer. And I said, well, that water's not any good. I said, because the spirit of water's not in it. And I said, uh, wait just a minute, let me, let me see what I can do. So I worked on the water there for about 30 seconds. I said, take a drink of it. And they had kind of a express expression on their face that the water's good. I said, that was the plan. So uh, we learned to do this in, uh, over the phone, uh, by Skype, uh, by most any kind of communication. Probably the one I'm most uh, pleased about, it was uh, about four years ago, there were 30 folks from Italy that came over for a class, and uh, I said, oh, I'd like to do something for you folks. You've come halfway around the world to see me. So I'd like to do you a favor. I understand you folks over there in Italy don't have real good drinking water. That's probably why you drink so much wine. So I'd like to try something. And now, please understand, this is an experiment. I don't know if it's going to work, but uh, let's just try it. Whenever you get home, there will be good tasting water flow out of your kitchen faucet. Well, I was thinking it was going to be about a week before they got home, but it didn't work that way. They sent a text message back home to their family and said, taste the water. It was already good. That really got my attention, and I think, okay, what else can we do anyway? 
And every time we win something or get a good success, that's always a question. What else can we do now? And we just keep looking for other things to do. And that's why I want to share a few of these with you here. Uh, so we started uh, uh, reaching out to other, uh, other places, other people, and so on. So I uh, got an email one day from a person I only knew by email that said he would like to promote my work down in Central America. And I said, well, let's see what we can do to help you out. So we had our little techniques book printed in Spanish. And uh, that seemed to work. And he goes down there and works, uh, takes the methods that I share, uh, teach to the medicine people and the healers and the various type of people in the remote sections about the friend of mountains. And one day uh, he sends me an email. He says, you might be interested to know that your work has been recognized and accepted uh, as a legitimate form of healing by the Nicaraguan government. And I said, well, that's nice. I don't guess I'll ever come down to, to, to talk to them about it, but that's real nice to know that they've been open-minded enough to accept something like this. And I really am pleased to provide you with as much information as possible so you can help those folks down there. You see, I don't really care too much about traveling myself, so I send representative uh, places if they want to do that. When we started making films, um, we started thinking, okay, what's really needed out there? And I decided I would make one uh, about freedom, because freedom's always been real important to me. Uh, people ask me what I believe in, I've got two answers. The first one's kindness. I believe in kindness and I believe in freedom. And that's pretty much ahead of anything else I might believe in. So we made a little film called Blueprint for Freedom. Well, at first we sold it, and then we just started giving it away. So you can go to my website and find it, and uh, feel free to share it with people. But this is what I uh, intended it to do, and it seems to be working. If you have kids in school and they're having problems, well, play that video and direct it at the school. You say, how do I do that? Well, you know how to play, play the video. Use your mind. That's how you direct it just with intent. And we've uh, had a lot of feedback of folks that clean up schools, you can clean up offices, you can clean up, I guess, about anything with it. That was the plan anyway. Now, I can't prove that this is right, and I, I, but after we did that, within about three months, no, there was the largest pedophile roundup in the history of the world over in Europe. Some of the folks at Dallas and said, that film had something to do with it. I'd like to believe that, but I don't know that for a fact. But, you know, it's, it's good to think maybe it helped. And that was the plan, too. Uh, so um, feel free to, to go to the, my channel, uh, website, whatever, and share any of that stuff and use it. That's why we put it out there. It's, it's free. So just go ahead and use it. All right, folks, I want to share another idea with you that I've only been doing since this past November. Um, I work with a uh, pop music star in Europe, uh, a good friend of mine, and I had been clearing concerts for her and in Russia and Spain and Ukraine and Czechoslovakia and various places. And I always like to clean up an audience wherever I'm going to speak, and in this case I wanted to clean up the audience where she would be performing. So uh, I said, how many people do you think you're going to have there? I said, oh, maybe 15,000. Well, that's a lot bigger crowd than what I ever had. I said, let me see what I can do. So, now folks, this may stretch your mind a little bit, but that's okay, because once the mind is expanded, it can never return to its original size. So I checked what percentage of the people in the audience, there, there were two performances in Russia, one in Moscow, one somewhere else. In Moscow, about 20% of the audience had negative entities. Well, that wasn't too awful unusual. So I just did a mass clearing on, on how, to, how to clean them up. Uh, and that raised the energy, and she, um, after the show, she, she uh, wrote, sent me an email just as she was going on stage, she sent me another email just as soon as she had signed all the autographs and got the pictures made and all that. And said, this show went so much better than it 
been going. Well, yeah, that was the plan. That's usually what happens when you clean up an audience. So then she had another show at another place in, in Russia, and I got an idea. I said, all the people that's going to be attending there, 15, 20,000 of them, they've all heard your music. That's why they're, they're going to show up. Why don't we put an intent into your music that wherever it is played, it will be the same as if I were there doing an exorcism on the crowd? Well, <laughs> whenever she started to go on stage at the other location, I checked it out to find out what percentage of the people here have injuries. Nobody. There were none in the concert hall. There were none in the hotel. They just weren't there. Now, this was a first. We got pretty excited about that. Then there was another one in Spain, another one in the Ukraine. Same story. We actually put the intent in her music that would do an exorcism wherever that music was played. I don't think that's ever been done before. So we got real excited about that. And like, okay, what else can we do to it? So we decided we'll put the spirit of freedom in there. We'll put the spirit of kindness in the music. So uh, the experiments we've been doing have really paid off as near as we can tell. Because the next show she did, I did not personally have to do a clearing. The music did the clearing. And she had to stay over a few extra hours just to sign autographs and have pictures made. The people just loved it. it she said, this is the best show I've ever put on in my life. And she's been doing this for years. So uh, this stuff works, folks. You just got to kind of open up your mind and figure out, okay, what can we do next? And uh, that's, uh, that's how we got here. We do an experiment, see what happens. Then see what we can learn and do another one. I'd like to tell you another story about one of my farmer friends. You know, farmers and ranchers are among my favorite people because they kind of feed the world. I've got a, several sayings, not particularly all the way politically correct. One is it's bad manners because a farmer with your mouth full. So anytime that a farmer's in trouble or a rancher, I always do whatever I can to help them out. So this goes back probably seven years this month, I think. Uh, this being, I'm filming this about the 21st of May, if I looked at the calendar right. And a friend of mine called and he says, I have a, have a problem here on the farm. I said, well, what's your problem? He said, well, I had some uh, weeds in my alfalfa field. Now, alfalfa is the type of hay that he, uh, or grass, that makes hay out of it, they used to feed cattle. And he said, I called the farm supply store for them to come out and spray the weeds. Well, the driver picked up the wrong jug of chemicals and sprayed 20 acres of alfalfa with a roundup. Now, sometimes, folks, it's better if you don't have the whole story. Because if you know too much sometimes, you, your logical mind will start thinking and say, oh, this can't be done. So he didn't tell me the whole story. I thought that the field had just been sprayed that day. I, I'll tell you the rest of the story in a minute, but that wasn't quite true. I said, well, how long is it going to take for you to overcome this? He said, a year. I got to plow up the field, re the seed. Not only that, he's losing his whole hay crop for that year. And he normally gets three cuttings of hay per year. Well, that's enough to bankrupt a small farmer. And I said, don't, don't plow it yet. You give me two days. Let me work on it. Well, he didn't contact me in two days. He didn't contact me for 30 days, the day that he cut hay. The alfalfa was up over four feet tall. And he said, it's the best crop we've ever had. And that year, instead of getting three cuttings, he got five. Now, what he didn't tell me was that there was not a single living alfalfa plant left in the field. If I had known that, I would have said I can't help. But I didn't know. So I said, let me try. Maybe I can do something. What did I do? 
when I scrambled the frequency, if it's just a term I have in getting rid of any kind of pollutants, I scrambled the frequency of the, out, uh, the Roundup and transformed it into fertilizer. Now folks, that defies everything people know scientifically about Roundup and fertilizer. But did it work? Well, the farmer thinks it did. He had five good cuttings of hay that year to prove it. So uh, this is just what can be done when you don't know you can't do it. So um, then we get into other areas too, uh, because uh, the world has a never-ending line of problems, seems like, and most of those folks seem to have my address, so I get a lot of practice. People ask me, how do you douse as fast as you do? Well, they get a lot of practice, because uh, you don't ever come to the end of the line of folks that need help. So I get asked a lot of times uh, to bring rain for crops. Now, in all honesty, sometimes I can. Sometimes it didn't work. I don't want to give you the impression that everything I do works all the time because it happens. But it's worked a lot of the time. So I have a friend down in Paraguay, South America, that has planted over 50,000 trees down there to help reforest. And I've had a few phone, uh, not phone calls, but uh, emails from him that will say, it's really dry here. Uh, and if we don't get rain, the trees are going to die. Well, it usually rains within sometimes the next day, sometimes a few hours. Uh, and then sometimes it takes two or three days, sometimes I have to do it again. You say, well, what did I do? I talked to the spirit of the rain and ask it to come and water the trees. So you'll get a lot more in life if you ask than you do if you don't ask. So I just uh, respectfully ask for the spirit of the rain to come and water the trees. I uh, believe in living with nature as best I can. I wish I could have gotten smarter faster, but it did the best I could. Then uh, I have a friend over in Italy that wrote me one day and said, we're in a terrible drought here. Can you send rain? Well, I don't know, but I can ask. I mean, you've got an awful lot of water all around you there. Maybe we can get part of it to come up into the clouds and turn into rain. And it rained the next day. And that has happened quite a number of places, but every now and then you need to stop a rain or stop a storm or whatever. Now you folks are older doubters, remember Joe Smith from Johnson, Nebraska. Uh, Joe was a real good friend of mine, really good dowser, and he knew a whole lot more about dowsing than I do. But I taught him a trick one day which he used. He said there was a hailstorm coming across uh, Nebraska there, and he picked it up on the weather. He knew it was coming. And I taught Joe to stick an ax in the ground, facing in the direction that the storm was approaching. So he uh, took my word, and he goes out there, if I remember right, and stuck an ax in the ground. And what happened? The storm split. And the farms around him got a lot of hail that just beat the crops in the ground pretty bad. Joe's farm got a good rain. Well, that's not the only time that's been done. I have a friend up in Pennsylvania, he's an army colonel, he had a farm up there. And there was a hurricane, I don't remember the name of it now, I seldom remember the name of hurricanes, but it's been about five years ago that was coming up the East Coast. And he called me and he said, what was it you told me to do to split a storm? I says, to go out there and face the storm and stick an ax in the ground. Now you need what we call a double bit ax with a blade on, on each end. One to go on the ground, one to split the clouds. And uh, he said, I can't find my ax. I said, well, just pretend you got one. You know what, it worked. The storm split and went all the way around his farm. And you say, that's impossible. Well, if you say that for you, you're probably right. But it wasn't impossible for him. It wasn't impossible for Joe Smith. And it's not impossible for me. Why? Because I believe it can be done. These other fellows believe it can be done. See, folks, our belief system is the dominant factor that controls everything that happens to us. And Henry Ford is quoted to have said, whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And I have another saying. 
And I, I listen to people a lot of times when they talk. They listen, I listen to them more than they realize I do. They'll tell me about their problems, but as they tell me, they're also telling me why they have the problems. Now, they don't know they're telling me this. They don't even know why they're having the problems, but they tell me. I just listen to them talk. And if they are always talking about how broke they are, how sick they are, they have all the details of every operation that they ever had, they've done told me why they have problems, because that's where they put their energy. They don't put their energy in good health. They put them in problems. And that's why they got it. So right here is a phrase that you might want to remember. And this is the first time I ever quoted this one publicly. Listen carefully. Pessimists are seldom disappointed. Just remember that. So uh, this goes back to energy follows thought. So if you want it to rain, think of rain. If you want it to stop raining, split the clouds and have the rain go around you or stop. It, can everybody do this? Everybody can't even drive a car or ride a bicycle. But a lot of people can do it. And if you folks were sharp enough and weren't interested enough in learning to be watching this, you can probably do it. So um, give it a try and you'll find out. Now, let's talk about another subject here. Ever since I was just a kid, it always bothered me because there had been people in history that had been mistreated and tortured and abused. That, that kind of stuff has always bothered me. I always wanted to do something about it. Didn't know what to do. And recently, a few years back, I found out something. I found out that time is not the way we have believed it to be. That it is possible to go back through time and change things. Now, I don't realize I'm stretching your mind here, but then again, that's the plan. Now stop and think, this is not as far-fetched as it might sound. If you were to tell a story about something funny that happened to you when you was a kid, you're probably gonna laugh. If you tell about the day that your little pup got run over by a truck, you might cry, but at least it'll make you sad. Why? What are you doing? You're bringing the energy from the past into the present. Well, I found that it was possible to go back in time and change things, prevent it from happening. So I want to tell you the best story I have. And I'm telling it to you the way that I understand that it happened. Uh, we're doing a place up in New York, uh, in the mountains of New York, here about four years ago. And as I was leaving, there was a very polite lady came up and asked if I would be willing to have a phone conversation with her. And I said, well, sure. Just send me an email and give me your phone number and let me know what you want to talk about. Well, I've had a lot of emails in my life, but that was the worst one I ever got. It was a story of torture and abuse and suffering and starvations and beatings. There wasn't any good news in it. Well, it was so bad that it just really affected me. I mean, got, I just got really angry. So I just immediately called her. Well, she recited about the same thing verbally that she put in the email. And she told me about how that she had suffered for 37 years. She was 43 years old, so she had suffered ever since she was six. She said she had pain every day. She had nightmares every night. Said, I've not had a good night's sleep 37 years. Wake up screaming every night. But what the real part was, which I'd already read in the email, but she was starting to tell me about it. Some sadistic boyfriend of her mom's had picked her up, a little six-year-old kid now, picked her up and set her on a hot stove naked. And she had 15 scars on her butt from that experience. Well, I just lost it. And I did something. And she started to cry. And when she could get her voice back, she said, the pain's leaving. I said, well, I'm real glad to hear that. I said, I can't talk to you anymore now. 
I've got to get myself together a little bit. Uh, that story kind of tore me up pretty bad. So a couple of hours later, I call her. Pain's gone, or most of it. Next day, I get an email. She's overslept that morning. Went in nightmares. 30 days later, I got another email. Said I wanted to wait 30 days just to make sure it worked. I've overslept every morning since you worked on me. Haven't had any pain, and all 15 scars disappeared. How'd that happen? I went back in time and stopped it from happening. You want to know how I did it? Okay, I'm going to show you. If you freak out, that's your problem. As she was telling me the story, I pulled out my knife, and I had one bigger than this one. I didn't bring the big one today. And as that guy reached down to get a hold of her, I stuck a knife in his heart. And yeah, you folks may have a problem with that. That's your problem, not mine. That's the way I solve problems. So, some people like what I do, some people don't. But I get results. And the reason why I get results is because of strong intent. So, um, I have told this story in class a number of times. And every now and then there's somebody that says, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you say a prayer? Why didn't you visualize? And I've got a standard answer. Lead, follow, and get the hell out of the way. And it's pretty blunt, but the way it feels, who I am. So, uh, you folks out there could do a whole lot more with doubting if you just kind of ignored a lot of the rules. That's what I've done. And uh, so far, it's worked real good. Okay, I want to talk to you about something else. Uh, I, as I've traveled across North America, I always ask a question when I'm doing a class. How many of you people got kids in school? Hands go up. Okay, uh, let's check the energy of the school. Most of the energy is pretty bad, really. Not all of them, but most. So I said, let's clean the schools up. And I do my best to teach parents, if they'll listen, how to do this. Because we've been able to lower violence in schools. We're kids, we stop bullies. We've been able to do some really, pretty good stuff at this. But I actually was at a place one time and folks asked if I would clean the schools up for their grandkids. And I was sure I'd be glad to. Not only that, I'll tell you how to do it and show you how, so you don't need me anymore. I'm back a year later. Are you folks working on schools? Well, no, we got to thinking that there's other kids go to school there and we might be interfering. Oh, wait a minute. This, this don't make any sense. It's your kids that go to school there, your grandkids. Don't it make sense to do, clean the place up and do something good for all the kids there and the teachers too? Well, we didn't have permission from the school board. Well, you didn't need it. Get this to your head, folks. It's something that affects your family. You don't need to ask anybody for permission. I know that's one of the rules and that's one I broke every time. And I've won every time I broke it. So just get that out of your head, folks. If it's got has something to do with you and your family, you don't need to ask anybody. Just do it. A couple of people have come through my place in the last 22 years that were really outstanding people. And I'd like to recognize them. Now, one of them you can see on a video. It's on, uh, if, if you go to my website, there's a place on there somewhere, I don't really know all the details, of the TV show, and the, I'm wearing a straw cowboy hat there, and there's a fellow sitting beside me, and that's Jeff Jones. Jeff was in a place with me back in 97, and I was showing people how to energize one simple little old cup of water, and uh, he said, you put energy in that water? And I said, yeah, I think so. He said, well, if you put energy in it, I can put vitamins and minerals in it. I never thought of that. Good idea. That was in January of 97. He quit eating. That's been, what, 23 years now? People tell me it's impossible. Well, yeah, for them it probably is, but not for him. He didn't know that. He lives on water. 
He puts all his nutrition in water. Lived on for 23 years. That's a pretty strong belief system, but it works. I just seem to attract people that are unique and do things the rest of the world don't know can be done. And that was really my goal, was to attract people that can do something. Another one is my friend Benny Pig. Uh, oh, he's over in uh, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. And Benny called me one day uh, and said, would you help me do something? I said, well, yeah, I always help you if I can. And I've told this story in a number of places before, and I don't know if folks believe me or not, but I'm telling you the story as it is related to me, and I believe it's true. He said, we got a problem down here with uh, girls disappearing. He said, 12 disappeared this year, and I think this was about seven years ago now. And he uh, said, I found out where they're going. So I'm, I'm going to kind of be brief with the details, but basically they were getting kidnapped and they disappeared. And he said, these girls will never, never make it home. Our parents will never see them again. He said, I found out where they're going, how they're getting captured, and will you help me stop it? And I said, sure. So I want to tell you how we did this. And this is another one, it's kind of a bloody story, but uh, it's okay, it worked. I created me a thought form. A thought form is just an, an image, an imagination. And I gave it a title. And the title was Human Trafficker. I just had a way to identify uh, this. So what I did, I went through the normal process of clearing away any demonic forces, which they had some, any entities, which they had a lot of, taking away any archetypes that would uh, contribute to that type of business or lifestyle. And then I created this form out in front of me and I did that. Same way I stopped the girl from getting set on the stove. Same principle, same kind of people really. Well, Benny was in McClay's last year, over in Charlotte, North Carolina, he said, According to what he can find out from the police, had many girls disappeared since. So, what do we do? We solve problems, and we break rules, and we don't really pay a whole lot of attention to what people think about it. So, whenever you stop caring and having to please the world, you can probably get something done. So. I want to tell you one more story, uh, and I just got, uh, should, uh, I should have told this when I was telling the story about water, but I simply forgot it, so I'll tell you now. Back in the spring, I had a lady in my class from Salem, Oregon, and this was a story I got, so I'm just telling it as it was her story. She said that, but someone also, when I told this story on a radio show or a dowsing show or something one night, uh, someone heard me and sent me a newspaper article to confirm what the woman said. That there's a lake where Salem, Oregon got its water and there was something about the algae bloom there that uh, had polluted the water. And there was a quarantine on the water. They could uh, bathe with it, wash cars, but not, not, not drink it. And this was in May of last year, 2019. And it was announced on the radio that it might be October before the quarantine on the water was lifted. Well, this lady takes one of my recordings where I have energizing water, drives up to the lake, and plays the recording with the intent that that energy is going into the lake. Two days later, the quarantine was lifted. So, see, we put out a lot of videos, information, Showed you how to clean up schools, work, clean up your workplace, clean up water. We provided a lot of information out there. Why? Because we want to help you to make a better world and a better life. So I want to thank you for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I will answer them as best I can. Sometimes I get overloaded. But if you want to write me at Raymond. That's R-A-Y-M-O-N at RaymondGrace.us. I'll do my best to answer your questions for you.
Uh, maybe a few days late, but I'll get to them if I can. So I want to thank you for listening. Enjoy the rest of the conference.